Shalom. Welcome to Mysteries of the Messiah. In this series, we're going to unlock unknown mysteries and connections about Jesus the Messiah from a Jewish and Messianic perspective. I am so excited to go on this journey with you because it makes the scriptures come alive in amazing ways when we understand how Jesus is in every detail of the scriptures. You know, this reminds me, a number of years ago, right before the Super Bowl, I went out and bought a high definition television. I was so excited, people said, it will completely change your perspective when you watch the game in high def. So I watched the entire game. I was like, man, I don't know what people are talking about. This doesn't seem so great to me. And then at the end of the game, I'm bored and I start flipping through the channels and all of a sudden I have a revelation, a realization. And that is that the higher channels are the high definition channels. I realized I watched the entire game in standard definition, and when I saw it in HD, it really did make a difference. Friends, so many times people are reading the Bible in standard definition when we can read it in high definition. This is what Mysteries of the Messiah, this series is all about. When you see how the old and the new connect, it makes the Bible come alive in new and amazing ways and it gives you a sense of excitement about God's word, about the things that are still there to be unlocked and revealed. One of these mysteries that help us to see the Bible in high definition is found in the very opening word of the book of Genesis. The first letter of the book of Genesis in Hebrew is the letter B, bait in the word beginning. And the last letter of the book of Revelation is the word Amen. It ends with the letter N or Hebrew Nun. The first letter of the Bible and the last letter of the Bible in Hebrew spell the word Ben, which means son. Because from beginning to the end, it all points to the Son of God, Jesus. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about my journey and how I came to this understanding. I grew up in a traditional Jewish home in New Jersey. I went to Hebrew school as a child. I was bar mitzvahed at the age of 13. Being Jewish was really important. I lost most of my family during the Holocaust. And as I got older, I eventually started working in a large recording studio in New York City, looking at the lives of all these famous people around me. I said to myself, there has to be more than just this. And I began a spiritual journey. I started studying with my rabbi in my traditional synagogue, but I also started to study martial arts and yoga, Eastern philosophy, and I started meditating because I was really looking for a personal relationship and encounter with God. And then my best friend, John, came to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And one day he calls me on the phone and he says, Jason, do you think you could tell the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament? And he read me this passage about this man that had to be crucified. And he said, Jason, older new. And I said, obviously, John, that's the New Testament. It's talking about Jesus. He said, very good. Let me read you another passage. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And by his chastisement, we receive peace. By his stripes, we're healed. He said, Jason, is that the old or the new? I said, obviously, John, that's talking about the New Testament. He said, no, that's the Jewish prophet Isaiah, written in the 53rd chapter, 700 years before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth. And I began to be provoked to jealousy because in all my years in the synagogue, I had never heard that passage growing up. And so I realized I needed to learn more and find out who this Jesus was. So I wind up going to this Messianic congregation and at the end of the evening, they begin to pray. I prayed and it was there that I received the Messiah kind of through a altar call, which I didn't really understand what it was, but they gave me the first New Testament. I was not sure about my decision. I wound up taking it home. Curiosity got the better of me. I read the New Testament. I was blown away how Jewish it was, how all the Messianic prophecies tied together, and I was just amazed and I came to the realization that Jesus truly was the one Moses and the prophets spoke of. 
My mom found that Bible hidden in my room. She got really upset. She's like, you've become a follower of Jesus. What is this? You've joined a cult. Go meet with the rabbi. So in preparation to go meet with the rabbi, I took out my Jewish Bible and I underscored all of the Messianic prophecies. I studied all of them. And I was just amazed how many prophecies in the scriptures, how much of the old all points to Jesus in the new. I met with him and that really set the foundation for how I study and understand the scriptures. It really began to transform my life and give me a sense of excitement about God's word and all of the connections. There was a sense of awe, there was a sense of wonder, there was a, a deeper love and respect and excitement for the word when we see how the old and the new connect. This is what Jesus was doing on the road to Emmaus with his disciples, and this is what Matthew 13, 52 is talking about. It says, every Torah scholar discipled for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out of his treasury both new things and old. And this is what made me want to be a Messianic rabbi. A Messianic rabbi is a Jewish person that has studied to understand the Jewish customs, traditions, and the Torah, but who believes in Jesus as the Messiah, both the Old and the New Testament, but expresses their faith in a way that honors their heritage. In this session of Mysteries of the Messiah, we are gonna start in the beginning with looking at the mysteries of the Messiah as revealed in creation, Adam, and the fall. We see Messiah from the very first word and letter of the story. There are mysteries to be revealed. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 begins, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'ha'ar, it's in Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first word, Bereshit, in the beginning, can actually be broken up in Hebrew and read as two words. Reshit means in the beginning, or it can mean the first, and the letter Beit can mean through. So literally, Genesis 1, the first word can be read, through the first or the firstborn, God created the heavens and the earth. So from the very first word, we see that creation was made through the Messiah, that he was the agent of creation. This is exactly what John is talking about in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginnings. All things were made through him, and apart from him, nothing was made that has come into being. Wow, John 1 is reading Genesis 1 in the way that is faithful to the Hebrew text. Jesus is the author of creation. It's amazing. But there's more. Because the very first letters of the word Bereshit, the first three letters are Beit, Resh, Aleph. And then the second word, bara, God created out of nothing. The word bara means to create out of nothing. Also has the first, same three letters as the first three letters, Beit, Resh, Aleph. Why is that important? Because it's actually an allusion to the Trinity. Beit is the Son, the Ben. The Resh is the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. And the Aleph is the Abba or the Av. So in the work of creation, the very opening letters of the first two words allude to the fact that the Son, the Spirit, and the Father were all involved in creation. It's pointing to the triunity of God. Amazing. But then they have to ask the question, why is it Son, Spirit, Father? Why not Father, Son, and Spirit? Because we're talking about creation. We're talking about God physically creating the world. And so it goes from the most physical and tangible representation of God in the Son. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God stepped out of time and eternity and became part of creation, took on a human form. Then the Spirit, because we can have the Spirit living in us, we can encounter the Holy Spirit. And then 
the Father is the last because no one can see the Father. The disciples asked Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one can see the Father anytime, but if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Wow, I don't know about you, but this is amazing. From the very opening verse, it's talking about the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's something else that's really significant for us to be able to understand. The word Bereshit in the beginning can be read through the firstborn, but another way to read it is on account of the firstborn, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, what does it mean on account of? Well, the idea is this. The rabbis say that God created the world for the sake of the Messiah because he saw that sin and sickness would come into the world. And God in his grace and his mercy wasn't going to create the world if there wasn't already a cure and an antidote before the curse of sin and death came into the world. So in Jewish thought, God went to the Messiah and he said, I'll only create the world if you are willing to suffer and die for the sake of redeeming my people. And this is exactly what John again is referring to in the book of Revelation, that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before one thing came into existence, God had already determined that Jesus the Messiah was going to die for your sins and my sins. And this is what is being spoken of in the very first word of Genesis chapter 1. And what we also read about in the book of Colossians where it says this, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in all things. For God was pleased to have in him all the fullness and through him to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the cross, the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Wow, this passage ties back the beginning, the end, the cross, heaven and earth. The crown of God's creation was man and woman. He placed them in the Garden of Eden, the special place that he prepared for them. But there was a problem in paradise the serpent came and tempted Eve, and Adam and Eve wound up eating from the tree, and it led to the fall, sickness and death, and a curse coming over all of creation. And in the midst of God coming down to judge the man, the woman, and the serpent, God gives a ray of hope even in the midst of judgment. Genesis 3.15 says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, between your seed and her seed, he will crush your head and you will crush his heel. This is the first messianic prophecy in the scriptures that God was going to raise up through the seed of the woman, a redeemer that would come to reverse the curse and restore the blessing. This is one of the major overarching themes of the scripture and is especially important for understanding Jesus's life and death in the New Testament. He is is the seed of the woman, also known as the second Adam. Did you ever wonder why Jesus had to die on a cross of all the ways he could have died? Think about it for a minute. Man stole from the tree in the very beginning. So God put back on the tree for you and me what the first man and woman couldn't do to make a correction and a redemption. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross, because it was a tree. Why did he have to have his hands pierced? Because our hands stole from the tree. Why were his feet pierced? Because the first messianic prophecy is that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent would crush the feet of the woman. It's fulfillment of the messianic prophecy in Genesis 3.15, dealing with his feet. And then what happens? Jesus has his side pierced. Why is his side pierced? Because who is the one who led Adam into temptation? It was Eve, the one taken from the side. So he's making an atonement for not only the sin of the man, but also for the sin of Eve. He had a crown of thorns on his head. Why a crown of thorns on his head? Because what's the physical sign of the curse of creation? The ground would produce thorns and thistles. Jesus literally takes the curse of creation on his head to reverse it and to restore the blessing. But of course there is more. Part of the mysteries that we want to reveal 
are found in the numbers. See, numbers in the Bible are really important, but we need to understand is that Hebrew is alphanumeric. That means that in the Bible, the way that you write numbers is with letters. So if I wanted you to open your Bible to chapter one, verse one, I'd say open your Bible to Aleph, Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew Bible and has the value of one. Aleph, Aleph, one, one. So what that means is that every Hebrew word has a numerical value. And those numerical values oftentimes are significant and they reveal deeper truths in the scriptures. Both Hebrew and Greek are alphanumeric. I don't think that's a mistake or that that should surprise us because we live in a mathematical universe and so God's word also has a mathematical aspect to it. I wanna look at a number connected to the creation account that's gonna shed some light on this story for us and help us see some mysteries come into high definition. It's the number six. Man was created on the sixth day. So six is the number of man. Six is also the number, in a sense, of the physical universe. One example of that is there are six directions, north, south, east, and west, up and down. Six, biblically, is the number of the physical world in connection to man being created on the sixth day and the six days of creation. But what's interesting is that in Jewish thought, man fell on the sixth day. And that's why when Jesus comes, he dies on Friday. It's called in Christian tradition, Good Friday. Why on Friday of all the days of the week, there has to be a reason because it's the day that man fell. So on the same day that we fell, Jesus comes and dies on the cross. But of course, we have to go deeper here. The first use of the number six or the letter Vav in Hebrew, because the way that you write the number six is with the Hebrew letter Vav is in Genesis chapter one, verse one. There are seven words in Hebrew in Genesis one, verse one, corresponding to the seven days of creation. The sixth word of Genesis one begins with the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Vav. The letter Vav there is literally the letter that connects heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens, Vav, earth. Why is that important? When we sinned on the sixth day, we broke the vav. We broke the connection between heaven and earth. And that's why Jesus has to die on the sixth day because he comes to restore the connection so that life, abundant life and blessing can flow back to us. Wow, <laughs> but there's still more. When we look at the number six and the connection of heaven and earth, it also connects to the fact that Jesus was on the cross for six hours. And there was darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And so we see with the redemption of Jesus, lots of things in connection to the number six because he comes to restore the blessing, the connection between heaven and earth. So what does this mean for you and me when we talk about the mysteries of the Messiah in creation? God made the world with wisdom. I love this verse from the book of Jeremiah. This is what it says. He made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, and stretched out the heaven by his understanding. Everything God made, he made with wisdom. Everything that he made, he made with understanding, and that includes you. And that's so important because so many times the world, the flesh, and the enemy wants to make us feel like we're worthless, wants to make us feel like we're dumb, wants to make us feel like we have no value, want to make us feel like we can't do anything great in our lives, maybe even like we're losers. There's so much judgment and negativity in the world, but what you have to understand is that you are one of his creations and that means you are made with wisdom. That means don't believe the lies that the world speaks over you, that the media speaks over you, that maybe that inner voice in your head is speaking over you. You are precious in his sight, beautiful and amazing, and you need to understand that and believe it, not just for yourself, but that should 
translate into how you see other people around you made in God's image and likeliness, valuing and loving all people. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that really speaks to my heart because I know when I was younger, even sometimes in ministry, I've had people come to me and say, Jason, you're not good at this. You should quit ministry. I've had people come and tell me, oh, Jason, uh, you, you need to lose weight or just negative things about me that really hurt. You are valuable to him. And so God created the world by means of words. Your words create worlds. So speak words of life, speak words of blessing, speak words of truth over yourself and over the people around you because your words create worlds. Don't be like the enemy speaking lies, but speak life and you'll bring blessing to many. As we come to the close of this session, I just want to pray a blessing over you, believing that the truths of this session that have changed my life will change yours as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, I just declare that you are beautiful, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have purpose and that you have identity as a child of God in him, that you should come out of agreement with any of the lies that have been spoken over you and come in to the truth, the truth that sets you free, that there is a plan and a purpose for your life in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name, amen.